First reading is from 1 Kings, chapter 8, verses 22 to, to 30, and then 41 to 43. Okay. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands to heaven. He said, O Lord, God of Israel, there is no God like you above or on earth beneath keeping covenant and steadfast love with your servants who walk before you with all your heart, their heart. The covenant that you kept with your servant, my father David, as you, you declared to him, you promised with your mouth and have this day fulfilled with your hand. Therefore, O Lord, God of Israel, keep for your servant, my father David, that which you promised him, saying, there shall never fail you a successor before me to sit on the throne of Israel. If only your children look to their way to walk before me as you have walked before me. Therefore, O God of Israel, let your word be confirmed, which you promised to your, fa your servant, my father David. But will God indeed dwell on the earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. Regard your servant's prayer and his plea. O Lord my God, heeding the cry and the prayer of your servant's prayers to you today, that your eyes may be open night and day towards his house, this place of which you said, My name shall be there, that you may heed the prayer of your servant's prayers towards this place. Hear the plea of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray towards this place. O oh, hear in heaven your dwelling place, heed and forgive. Likewise, when a foreigner who is not of your people Israel comes from a distant land because of your name, for they shall hear of your great name, your mighty hand and your outstretched arm, when a foreigner comes and prays towards this house then hear in heaven your dwelling place, and do according to all that the foreigner calls to you, so that all the peoples of the earth may know your name and fear you, as do your people Israel, and so that they may know that your name has been invoked in this house that I have built. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm this morning is at Psalm 84. And I'll just say it. How lovely is your dwelling place, O Lord of hosts. My soul longs, indeed, it faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh sing for joy to the living God. Even the sparrow finds a home, and the swallow a nest for herself, where she may lay her young. At your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. Happy are those who live in your house, ever singing your praise, Salah. Happy are those whose strength is in you, in whose heart are the highways to Zion. As they go through the valley of Baca, they make it a place of springs. The early rain also covers it with pools. They go from strength to strength. The God of gods will be seen in Zion. O Lord God of hosts, hear my prayer, give ear. O God of Jacob, Salah, behold our shield, O God. Look on the face of your anointed. For a day in your courts is better than a thousand elsewhere. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than live in the tents of wickedness. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. He bestows favour and honour. No good thing does the Lord withhold from those who walk uprightly. O Lord of hosts, happy is everyone in true trust in you. Now the New Testament reading is from the Ephesians, chapter 6, beginning at verse 10 through to verse 20. Finally, be strong in the Lord, in the strength of his power. 
Put on the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist, and put on the best plate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever you will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. Here's the word of God. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John, chapter 6, beginning at verse 56. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me, and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whatever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died, but the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said to them, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. But among you, there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first the, who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered them, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be always acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So friends, there's a, a story, it's a true story, I believe, this one. Um, you can make up your own mind whether it is or not. Um, a, a wise priest once told me this story, that he was... Uh, back in the 70s, when this sort of stuff was really common, he used to go and do RE, or RI, or whatever you want to call it these days, uh, in schools. <clears throat> and he went in and he was wearing his collar, as, as it was common to. Uh, and one little boy ran up to him and said to him, Oh, I know what that collar means. I know what the collar is. 
And he, his, his, his heart kind of leapt a little bit. He thought, oh, this is great. You know, this is a little sort of seven-year-old boy comes running up to him. Obviously, he's a well-churched kid. Uh, and he said, yeah. He said, that's a flea collar. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> These are the kind of, uh, you know, instances that you wish you kind of had yourself. Um, <laughs> it, it sort of, th- th- that story came to mind when I read um, the Old Testament reading, but funnily enough, this week. You have this great teaching uh, about the importance, really, of the place of worship to begin with, you know, even to the point of if a foreigner comes from another land in order to worship here, uh, basically make sure you treat them really well, right? Because we want to draw everybody in uh, and, and God wants everyone to be part of, of God's family, grafted on, all that sort of thing. Um, so when a foreigner comes for the, for the purpose of praying at the temple, make them feel good, treat them well, uh, so they too become part of this. It's an important idea of having a place to focus, a place uh, where God dwells. So we still do this kind of thing today, right? We have a church building uh, all over the place. Um, Some people may not have church buildings, but there will be a specific place that becomes their place that they go to to worship, uh, so it may not be a, a church building, but that place has spiritual significance for them because they gather there together, they pray together, uh, and as much as it may not be an official church building, it essentially becomes that for them. Uh, and you hear the great stories of churches that begin in the lounge rooms of people's houses and then eventually they become big churches. So it is true that the places where we worship, uh, like this one, uh, this lovely building uh, built in the early 90s uh, become important to us. Right? Uh, they become places where we encounter Christ together, uh, we pray together, and we partake in Holy Communion together. All of those great things. We have women's breakfasts and men's breakfasts. And we chat together uh, over coffee or at op shops. We hand food to people who need it the most. They're important places. But the Old Testament goes further than that because our reading from King says nowhere can contain God. Nothing is big enough to contain God. So the second import of that teaching is when we leave this place, it's no different to what it was when we were here. We have a different focus. We have a different intent. We come here for specific reasons. But when we leave the church, we are still the church. Right? God is still just as intimately with us. And our discipleship is still just as important to us in those times. So the story of the collar, why did I think of that? Well, Because at different times and in different places, we approach things in different ways depending on where we are. So if you come to a church... You see a priest or a minister standing up and they're wearing a collar. You know what that is, right? It's the the collar, the symbol of their office. Uh, They're here to do a specific duty and that duty is religious and spiritual. That's why we still wear robes and things at times. Because we're not not here uh, just doing a normal secular business thing, right? We're here very clearly for a specific spiritual reason. And the clothes that we wear wear reflect that. But when we're out in the world, the way that that kid uh, saw the collar as just a flea collar, right, (laughs) makes sense to him. And of course, he he wasn't in a specific place to worship. So how else would he uh, kind of relate that in his head? So here we dress in a certain way. Uh, Maybe out in the public, we just look like everybody else. Um, And it's the same kind of thing with our worship. Here we come here to worship specifically in a certain way. We follow certain rituals, uh, certain forms of service. But out in the public, you know, we're still worshipping every day. We're still praying every day. 
we have those deep discussions with people, when we're trying to uphold people and love people and guide people, that in itself is almost an act of worship. It just looks different. So then we come to the uh, Ephesians reading, and the author is really ramping up to the end of this letter. And to him, it's extremely important that they recognize and understand the spiritual forces that are happening all around them. So put this into context. This is uh, probably late first century uh, Palestine. You know that they were under Roman occupation at the time. So everywhere there were people with swords, shields, uh, armor, all of that kind of stuff. Sometimes that was used to keep the peace. Uh, and it was a good thing. Other times it was used to push people out of their land so that they could occupy it. Uh, sometimes it was used uh, to disallow certain types of religious freedom. And other times it was used to expand that. So depending on the region is how that they would, they would see that. But he's using common images and changing them to have spiritual significance. Right? So there's a little bit of a, a touchstone there, you know, putting on the armour of God. We have to be careful to realise that this isn't something literal. So when, we, when we're going into an, uh, you know, a situation where we may be worried about something spiritually, uh, we start praying for these specific swords and shields and armours and all that kind of stuff, that's not the important part of it. That's simply language that people would have understood to get the point across that these things like faith uh, and hope are important parts of our lives to keep us spiritually healthy. And it all relates just as much today. So I think we have, we've all been in positions at times, I guess, where we feel something was you know, the best way to use it, maybe dark. Have you experienced that before? Anybody? Nobody has experienced that? That's great. It's excellent. You're getting through life really, really well. Uh, or experiences where you just felt sort of weighed down by things. Yeah. So that, there's a spiritual reality to that, and it happens you know, through our human bodies because we can't get out of those. Whenever we think, we're thinking with a human mind. As much as we'd like to say things like, don't think with your human mind, think with your spiritual mind. Well, we're humans, we have those spiritual thoughts through human brains, right? But when we get in those positions, usually it's because somebody's not treating others well. Right? Quite often it's because there's some untruth going on uh, or there's someone trying to take advantage of another or we feel anxious going into a situation because we're worried about how somebody is going to treat us. Things like faith and hope are indispensable tools in those situations. Courage and compassion, all of those incredible things sustain us. And at the heart of that is Christ. Christ is the light in that darkness. The one that shines brighter than any darkness could possibly contain. And Ephesians was trying to get that across to a group of people who were just starting to follow Jesus and probably getting oppressed themselves. That was starting to happen. That oppression of the first Christians. Set your eyes upon Christ. Remember the light that Christ offers. And then we get to the Gospels where Jesus is talking again about his body and his blood and completely giving of himself. Could you put yourself in that position with the disciples today? Is it almost relatable? You have a group of people who followed this guy, right? One of many people claiming to be a Messiah around that time. Most of the others were put to death, uh, and their disciples also at times. And now he's saying, in no uncertain terms, he's going to give himself up. Completely give of himself for the sins of the world. You see how the disciples might be a bit afraid of that? 
This isn't what they were waiting for. They were waiting for a Davidic king to come in, usher in the new age in Jerusalem, and for Israel to take over the land again, right? That's not what Jesus came for. He came to flip that on its head and do something far more important that spreads far further than Israel. In fact, it goes across the globe. And so they say, Lord, this, this teaching is, is hard. How could we possibly follow this? And then a whole bunch we hear of his disciples just leave. You could almost imagine how Jesus would have felt at that time as well. He's standing there, he's teaching them this integral part of why he came, and then many just abandon him. But of course, he doesn't lose hope, he doesn't lose conviction. This is Christ, this is our God. He just looks at the twelve and says, what, are you guys going to leave as well? They say, where are we going to go? Right. Now, there's a, there's a very practical element to that. You know, they've followed this guy now, everybody knows who they are. Um, if they leave, they don't really have anywhere to go. He's already taught them, you know, leave your home, leave your family behind and follow me. They've done that. So practically, where are they going to go? But they make it very clear that they mean they have seen the truth of what he's saying. They understand who he is. There is no point in leaving him because there is nowhere better on this earth to be than with him. And so they stay with him. <clears throat> So friends, there's a lesson there for us as well. It's not, it's not always easy, being a follower of Jesus, right? It's certainly not always easy being a disciple, keeping integrity and keeping with your convictions. There'll be time when you'll say things and people will leave, metaphorically and physically. There'll be times when you're doing your best to follow Christ or follow the teaching or what uh, you feel Christ is leading you to, and it won't bring you instant joy. <laughs> it won't bring you everything you pray for. Because huh? heaven forbid we pray that you know, God just makes us comfortable or God just gives us what we need because that's not what we're here for. Right? This isn't, as I've said before, the divine vending machine. And you put your prayer coin in, you choose your B3, press the number, and then it gets stuck halfway and you're going to shake the machine or something. That's not what we're here for, right? Christ is at the core of all things. Christ pours out his grace and blessing upon the earth. And we are lucky enough to be workers with him. So our job is to go out and be Christ's hands and feet on earth, giving compassion and mercy, forgiveness, love, and grace as much as we can, holding fast when things are difficult. Remembering that when we're here worshipping in this space, we're here for specific reasons, we support each other, and we go out into the world to try and do the same, but to do that in new and different and exciting and engaging ways. When things go wrong, you know, when projectors or something die, right? We don't freak out about it, you know, we just pivot. Work with it, because we're here to worship. Things will change. Things will always change in life. But Christ is the cornerstone, the light, and the truth that we all follow and cling on to. So friends, as we go out into the world today, I pray uh, that we think of how we worship in our everyday lives. We think of what prayer looks like when we're not formally praying. Uh, we think of what discipleship looks like when we're not thinking about being disciples. I pray that we remember that Christ gave fully of himself, didn't become the dictator but became part of us, and that we give great thanks for this gift. We understand our responsibility and in all things worship the Lord that came to be with us. In the name of God, the creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Amen.